Maya Gavan and Melanine are medics we laid. I am David of Many Colours and welcome to part two in our book two series comparing Peter Jackson's movies with Professor Tolkien's writings. And I'll begin this video where the last one left off by jumping right to this unbelievably epic scene from the movies where the Fellowship first leave Rivendell and enter the wilds. And I absolutely love this part of both the books and the movies, but this is one of those areas in the story where the movies, for very good reason, speed up the pace of what's happening. Like, by a lot. And what I mean by that is, so from this moment to this moment, spans at most, I don't know, like five or six minutes of screen time in the movies, but in the books it takes the Fellowship 18 days to reach the West Gate of Moria. And quite a lot of interesting things happen in that time that are either glossed over or entirely cut from the movies. But before I get to them, one thing I will say is that I absolutely love how the movies include Bill the Pony in this epic Fellowship lineup. I actually have a whole video about Bill the Pony, and I think it's one of my least viewed videos on this channel, but it's also one of my favourite videos, so check that out after this one if you want to. Anyway, I feel like Bill the Pony could very easily have been left out of the movies, but he wasn't, and I appreciate that. Anyway, this country that the Fellowship eventually traverse after leaving Rivendell is called Holleen, which in a Manish language means Land of Holly. But in the Sindarin tongue, Land of Holly translates as Eregion, which is a name you've probably heard of. Eregion is the second age realm of Celebrimbor and the Gwaiathi Myrdain, who under Sauron's instruction forged the Rings of Power and then fought a massive war with him in which the realm of Eregion was laid to ruin, the rings were recovered by Sauron except for the Elven Three, and Celebrimbor was brutally slain. So there's a huge amount of history in this part of Middle-earth, and it's intimately relevant to the one ring that Frodo is carrying. The last time that this ring was in this land, the realm of the Elves was obliterated and all that's left now of it is ruins. In fact, I've actually read somewhere that this ruin in the movies was actually intended to be Ostina Vil, which is an elvish fortress where Celebrimbor probably lived, although it was actually originally founded by Galadriel and Celeborn before they moved east to Lothlorien, so this is a pretty cool little easter egg in the movies. Anyway, in the books, Holleen is described as a pretty creepy place. Aragorn's been here a few times before, and he remarks how although there are no people living in this part of the world, there's always been loads of birds. Except now there aren't. It's silent for miles around. And it's at this point in the movies where we get a lovely little scene that isn't actually in the books at all, but I think it is a really important moment where Boromir bonds with Merry and Pippin, which obviously sets up his sacrifice at the end of the movie. And I think this is one of my favourite scenes that the filmmakers invented. But it segues pretty seamlessly into another scene that Tolkien invented, where a cloud of Krebine appear and the Fellowship must hide from their spying eyes. And movie Legolas is absolutely right that these Krebine are from Dunland. They are not native to Holleen. All the local birds are mysteriously gone, but these regiments of foreign crows are spying the lands that connect the north to the south, and this is why the Fellowship decide that they can no longer keep travelling south. They're being watched, and so they're going to have to cross the Misty Mountains. And this brings us to another great example of the insanely rich and detailed world that Tolkien created. Because, of course, the Misty Mountains are pretty much in the middle of the map, and so they're a very important geographical feature to pretty much everyone who lives on either side of them. And roughly in the middle of the Misty Mountains lie the three mountains of Moria, the three most famous mountains in this range. And so, just as you'd expect from a living, breathing world, the men who lived in central Middle-earth had their own names for these mountains, but so too did the elves of the region, and so too did the dwarves. 
So what we get is three mountains with three names in three languages. In the Manish language of Westron, they are translated as Silvertine, Cloudy Head, and Redhorn. But in the Dwarven Kuzdul language, Silvertine is translated as Ziraxigil, which is the mountaintop where Gandalf kills the Balrog, and Cloudy Head and Redhorn are directly translated as Bundur Shafur and Barazinba. But they also have a trio of elvish names. So Silvertine in Sindarin is Kelebdil, which we see that Keleb, Silver, quite a lot. For example, Celeborn and Celebrimbor. Cloudy Head is translated as Fanuidol, and Redhorn is Karadras, probably the most famous mountain of them all. Now, this probably isn't the most important fun fact that I've ever come out with, but I think it really illuminates just how much thought Tolkien put into his fictional world. Anyway, as all of you will know, because the Passage South is being watched, the Fellowship attempt to cross the mountain of Karadras. But there are a few more important changes here between the books and the movies, and one of them is that in the movies, Gandalf is the one who insists they take the passage over Karadras as opposed to going through Moria, whereas Aragorn is the one telling them to turn back. But this is completely the opposite in the books. I guess the filmmakers wanted to foreshadow Moria as being like a really dangerous place for Gandalf by demonstrating his reluctance to go there, but in the books, Gandalf is the one who suggests Moria. There's one night where Frodo overhears a conversation with Aragorn where he suggests going over Karadras, and Gandalf is the one who suggests the dark and secret way that we have spoken of, to which Aragorn replies, let us not speak of it again. And I think it is worth noting that Aragorn has also been through Moria before. He knows what it's like, and he has very good reasons for wanting to avoid it. Which is why I find it so interesting that Gandalf, of all people, is the one to suggest it. Now, I might be overthinking things a little bit here, but part of me speculates that perhaps Gandalf has some sort of vague premonition that going through Moria is something he specifically has to do. And obviously, in a roundabout way, he's kind of right to think this. If the Fellowship never did go through Moria, Gandalf would never have been reborn as Gandalf the White. Everything would be different, and I really think the quest would have failed. Gandalf's death is a part of Eru Iluvatar's capital P plan, and so it had to happen. But anyway, at first, Aragorn gets his way, and so the Fellowship begin their ascent of Karadhras, but they do so on the 11th of January, in other words, the middle of winter. And so Karadhras is not a good place to be. Which brings us to the second major change in this part of the movie, and that's the role of Boromir. So movie Boromir for me is a highlight of the whole trilogy. I'll talk about it more when we get to The Two Towers and Return of the King, but I kind of feel like a lot of the mannish characters in the movies get a little bit short-changed from their book counterparts, but Boromir is the exception. I think he is a fantastically well-adapted character. However, in this scene in the movies, we see that Boromir is a pretty dodgy dude, like from the very beginning. I mean, the ring is obviously already having a negative effect on him, and we actually see that Aragorn is ready to fight him, which is a great way of visually reinforcing the corruptive nature of the ring, but it is also a big departure for Boromir's character. In the movies, it's telegraphed from scene one that Boromir is not someone you should really trust with the ring, and although he does come across very sympathetically in some scenes, these scenes are interspersed with a fair amount of uh, unscrupulous moments too. But this is not the case in the books. Boromir really doesn't begin to show much corruption until after they leave Lothlorien. It's on the Great River, on the Anduin, that we see a real change in this character and the extent to which he really is being led astray. And so, at this part of the story, on Karadhras, in the books, Boromir is nothing but helpful and supportive. 
Anyway, the reason, of course, that the Fellowship failed to cross Karathras is because of the evil weather that afflicts them. And in the movie, we're explicitly told that the storm on Karathras is conjured by Saruman. But in the books, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, okay, to be fair to the movies, it is pretty safe to say in Tolkien's writings that there is some degree of malice in this storm. It's not just natural snow, there is something evil at work, trying to deny the Fellowship passage. But what exactly that evil is, is debatable. And there's a few different possibilities here. So it's not impossible that the storm is conjured by Saruman, just like in the movies, but I think this is the least likely option. We don't really have much reason to believe that Saruman even knew that the Fellowship existed at this point, and although Isengard is built right at the foot of the Misty Mountains, it is hundreds of miles away from the mountains of Moria. This scene implies that Saruman can like see the storm that he's creating, but the mountain he's looking at is called Methedras, and it's approximately 400 miles away from where the Fellowship are. That's the equivalent of a guy standing in London and conjuring a storm in Edinburgh, or if you're American, standing in LA and conjuring a storm in San Francisco. It's a really, really long way away. So what are the other options? Well. Boromir actually suggests that the snowstorm might be a contrivance of the enemy, with a capital E, aka Sauron. He says that there are rumours in Gondor of Sauron governing storms in the mountains of shadow around Mordor, but Gimli thinks it's unlikely that this storm is directly the work of Sauron. Gimli says, his arm has grown long indeed if he can draw snow down from the north to trouble us here 300 leagues away. But to this, Gandalf says something very foreboding. His arm has grown long. And it's also possible that even if the storm isn't coming directly from Sauron, it might come from him indirectly. Because, of course, right to the north of the Misty Mountains are the evil mountains of Angmar, where the Witch King once ruled. So, could the blizzard on Karadras be some sort of leftover evil of the Witch Kings? Maybe. But this does run into the same problem as arguing that Saruman conjured the storm. I mean, Angmar is further from Karadras than even Isengard is, albeit in the opposite direction. And also, the Witch King hasn't been in Angmar for 1,043 years at this point, so I'm not quite convinced. But another compelling theory is that perhaps the malice on Karadras was put there not by Sauron, but by his old boss, Melkor. So if you've seen my early First Age videos on the war for the sake of the elves, you'll remember that the Misty Mountains are actually the youngest mountain range in Middle-earth. They were raised in the years of the trees by Melkor, the original Dark Lord, and their purpose was to form a barrier that would prevent the Valar, specifically Orome, from riding to the aid of the east, and also to hinder the elves from migrating into the west. And so, as mountains go, I think one could argue that the Misty Mountains are particularly imbued with evil. They are a legacy of Melkor's, and so perhaps even 10,000 years later, some of Melkor's discord remains. However, the theory that I personally think is most likely is that the storm isn't created by Sauron or the Witch King or Melkor, but instead by the will of Karadhras itself. Now, I know it may seem a bit weird to suggest that a mountain is capable of having a will, but hear me out on this. Later in the books, we encounter the two watchers of Kirith Ungol, which are stone statues, but they are described as being inhabited by some dreadful spirit of evil vigilance. So, could Karadhras also be inhabited by a dreadful spirit? Well, Gimli seems to think so. He tells us that Karadhras was called the Cruel long years ago, when the rumour of Sauron had not been heard in this land. And Aragorn backs up this theory. Boromir says to him, Let those call it the wind who will, 
There are fell voices on the air, and these stones are aimed at us. To which Aragorn replies, I do call it the wind, but that does not make what you said untrue. There are many evil and unfriendly things in this world that have little love for those that go on two legs, and yet are not in league with Sauron, but have purposes of their own. Furthermore, when the storm finally does become too much for the Fellowship, it is not Sauron or Saruman that Gimli curses, but Karadhras itself. He says Karadhras has not forgiven us, he has more snow left to fling at us if we go on. And later Gimli says it was no ordinary storm, it is the will of Karadhras. And even Tolkien writes that when the storm finally stopped, it was as if Karadhras was satisfied that the invaders had been beaten off. And the final sentence of this chapter makes no mention of the enemy, only that Karadhras had defeated them. So my thoughts on Karadhras are that he can tentatively be compared to someone like Old Man Willow. He is a malevolent spirit that has some sort of will, but absolutely no affiliation with Sauron or any other Dark Lord. He is simply another mysterious being of Middle-earth. But let me know what you guys think. Anyway, back to the movies, as soon as Frodo decides to turn back and take the journey through the mines, the scene cuts to the West Wall of Moria and to the Doors of Durin, but in the books there is an incredibly awesome fight scene before that which gets completely cut from the movies. So in the movies, Peter Jackson waited until the battle in the chamber of Mazabul to showcase the first time that the Fellowship fights together as a single unit, but in the books, after leaving Karadhras but before arriving at the doors of Moria, the Fellowship are attacked by a whole pack of evil wolves. And just like with Karadhras, these wolves are not ordinary products of nature. The wolves that attack the Fellowship are fascinating. Or perhaps I should call them wargs. Wargs is the word that Tolkien uses for these creatures, and these wargs can probably speak to each other in their own wargish language. Now, I've already done a whole video all about the differences between wargs and wolves and werewolves, and when I crack on with the tale of Beren and Luthien, this will become very relevant again. And although at first glance, these wargs in the Fellowship of the Ring may appear to be nothing more than aggressive wild animals, we know that this is not the case, and that's because of what happens to them after they die. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So, after being defeated by Karadhras, the Fellowship reluctantly decide they must go through Moria. But 15 miles before they reach the doors of Durin, they hear wolf voices coming from the mountains. And in the night, the wags attack. So, the Fellowship take up a defensive position at the top of a small hill that is circled by trees, but they are watched by this pack of wargs, and we're actually told about one great dark wolf shape that acts as a captain and summons the others to attack. But of course, as we all know, Gandalf is an absolute badass, and he shouts to the wolf captain, Listen, Hound of Sauron, Gandalf is here. I will shrivel you from tail to snout if you come within this ring. So, the wolf snarls and it sizes up Gandalf and it leaps towards him ready for a fight, but then Legolas just kind of shoots it in the throat, which I don't know if Tolkien meant that to be funny, but I find it kind of amusing. I imagine the look Gandalf must have given Legolas was like, dude, that one counts as mine. Anyway, later in the night, the wargs come back and they attack the fellowship from every side. And this is where we get a really cool action scene of the whole Fellowship fighting together for the first time. I mean, alright, not so much the Hobbits, they do just kind of stand back to back with their swords out, but Aragorn, he thrusts Anduril through the leader's throat, Boromir hews off a wolf's head, Gimli wields his dwarf axe, and Legolas's bow is singing. And while all that's going on, Gandalf is in the centre controlling fire, flashing it into lightning and shouting elvish words at the wolves. 
In fact, the battle ends when Gandalf gives a word of command and the circle of trees all burst into blinding flame. The wargs see this and they turn to flee, but then Legolas steals Gandalf's thunder again when he just goes ahead and shoots the fleeing wag chieftain. Although this time it is really cool because Legolas's arrow catches fire mid-air and plunges into the wag's heart. So with that, the battle is won. The trees fall to ash and the fellowship are finally able to sleep. But when the sun rises, they find that something really mysterious has happened to the dead wags. Their bodies have simply vanished. In fact, there's no evidence that they were ever even there, except for the burned trees and Legolas's arrows sticking out of the slopes. So what are these wags? Well, I think the short answer is that at some point in the past, evil spirits somehow came to inhabit wolf shapes. Whether that was willingly or whether they were kind of trapped inside them is unknown, but they are an intelligent, sapient, ancient evil that served both Morgoth in the First Age and Sauron throughout all of the Second Age and clearly even up to the very end of the Third Age. From The Hobbit, we know that they have their own language, and although in the Two Towers movie, and even in the Hobbit movies, they are portrayed as not much more than particularly vicious animals for orcs to ride on, in Tolkien's writings, wargs are a formidable enemy in their own right. They are, after all, the fifth army in the Battle of the Five Armies. Anyway, after their battle with the Warg, the Fellowship hurries south to the Doors of Durin, where they will, of course, encounter the Watcher in the Water before entering Moria. And so that's what I'm going to talk all about in the next video, the differences between Tolkien's portrayal of Moria and Jackson's, as well as some really cool details that the movies had to leave out. So, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss it, and hit like and leave a comment if you want to. Also, if you've enjoyed this channel, please share it with friends and fellow Tolkien fans, as that really is the best way to grow this community. Anyway, as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.